delighted to, to, to introduce our speaker today. My name is Tim Goldberg. I'm a professor in the College of Engineering in the School of Information. And I am a proud member of the, the Citrus Research Center. I'm also director of the Data Democracy Initiative. And we are, we are very delighted to, to, host, to be part of this series of lunchtime lectures. The, there's a number of things that are going on. We have online viewers, and I want to welcome them to, to today's talk. There will not be an I4 Energy presentation to this week, but because we actually have two very special events going on related to the topic of online education, in particular spurred by this development in massive online open courseware. So there will be on Friday and Saturday a symposium called Learning Mode, Critical Issues in Online Education that is sponsored by the Berkeley Center for New Media and the Data and Democracy Initiative. And this is going to be a two-day symposium. It's going to bring in a number of specialists and experts uh, who have experience in this, in this new and burgeoning topic. The New York Times, I think, said that 2012 is the year of the MOOC. So we will see what, this, uh, what, what the implications are. And it will be, so there will be full day, two days of discussion and, and, um, and presentations and dialogues. And then on Sunday, the on March 17th, which I think is also uh, so before the drinking kicks in, we're going to do a college readiness hackathon. And this is sponsored by the University of the UC, office, UC Office of the President. Will It is a hackathon to design mobile apps for facilitating students to apply to college. And we're going to have prizes awarded for the best prototype apps. And they're particularly targeting towards middle school, high school, and college transfer students. And you can register for both of those events on the web. And I would always say that if you register and you see one of these events are sold out, please consider coming anyway. There's always overflow space. And we will, we will squeeze you in if you're, uh, if you're persistent. So for today, I want to, I want to say I've been uh, uh, very excited about uh, uh, Greg Zachary, since I was first introduced to him uh, by John Mark, the topic of technology innovation, and particularly in the developing economies of Africa. He has extensive experience there. He's been on over 30 research trips to Africa, has many, many friends and contacts. He's incredibly well connected within the continent. He, he has a very nice roots here at Cal. He taught in the RJ School. He's also taught over down on the peninsula at Stanford. He's received fellowships from a number of organizations, including the University of Michigan and the German Marshall Fund. He has been a, a, a writer for the Wall Street Journal, senior writer from, from 89 to 2002. He was also a senior editor at Time, uh, Time Inc.'s uh, Business 2.0. And he also wrote the ping column on innovation for the New York Times. He has been he's, he's pro incredibly prolific. His articles are always uh, filled with insights and, 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 a, and a kind of very astute, um, critical, I would say, perspective on technologies. He doesn't, uh, he, he doesn't take anything at face value. And he has a really deep appreciation for a lot of the, um, the conventional wisdom and myths surrounding Africa in particular, and he is very quick to, um, to, to, to cut through a lot of, the, a lot of the, the, this, these false impressions and provide key insights. He has a book that just came out this year that is entitled um, Hotel Africa, The Politics of Escape, which is a collection of essays and insights. And today, he's going to tell us about his, his, his real vision of the new directions where things are going. And this is based on his experiences and research in Ghana and Uganda. So please join me in welcoming Greg Zachary. Thank you so much. Well, I'm, I'm delighted to, to present at Citrus and at uh, Cal. Uh, I teach throughout the academic year at, at ASU Tempe, Arizona. But I, I keep my heart in a house in the East Bay that I've maintained. and. Uh, it's just, it's just great to be here. Um, so this is a brief introduction to a complex subject. Um, I'm not a computer scientist. I study 
social, historical, political aspects of computer science and S&T generally. Um, you can see I had three periods of immersion, most recently in 2012 in Ghana, where I t attempted to benchmark changes uh, from 2002, 10 years earlier, where I had a very extensive few months of intense field research. So some of you know the stories we tell about Africa. Um, most recently, the, the Pistorius murder gets a lot of attention, uh, disease. Um, these elements are not to be ignored, but there's a new African narrative emerging. Uh, the Economist recently had a special report earlier this month, a hopeful continent, because about 2000 it ran an infamous cover calling it the hopeless continent, just as things were turning up and changing. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa, economic statistics are not always that useful because they don't reflect economic inequality, but um, six of ten world's uh, fastest growing national economies. Um, there's a boom in farming, uh, urbanization proceeding at the fastest pace in the world from the lowest base, and some of the uh, the bad things we think about Africa are at their lowest levels since the 1960s. Um, knowledge for development. Um, one, I'm going to insist, and I think there's a growing body of evidence that computer science and Africa is not an oxymoron, um, that there is computer science occurring in Africa and it's on a, a good trajectory. Uh, we know that transferring knowledge is important to development, but it has to be linked to generating new knowledge. And retaining talent often depends on the opportunities for generating new knowledge. Um, so Africa is a new frontier for creating techno-scientific communities, in this case computer science communities, and we're going to see that they, they will be somewhat diverse. So why computer science? I see computer science as an important proxy for the vitality, uh, judging the vitality of science and discovery generally. Uh, there are some structural reasons why computer science is interesting for Africa. The low cost of entry, um, few barriers to uh, participation. A few stars can make a large impact. If you compare CS with, say, expensive, the, the large teams, expensive equipment, um, the rigid protocols of, say, biomedical research or even clinical trials or space or astrophysics, um, you, you see that computer science offers a relative freedom and opportunity. Um, one important thing is that computer science represents Africans making contributions with brains and not only getting credit for uh, brawn and natural resources. This is a really, really important point to get across. Um, the democratization of science in Africa is occurring fundamentally through digital devices tied to computer science. Um, I'm going to focus on the importance of formal training in, in WECS, but that's not to ignore that bottoms-up approaches um, such as self-taught code writers are, are significant. There are other key actors, uh, entrepreneurs, business, government, uh, that of course are going to influence the importance of what scientists can do. Um, brain circulation um, that uh, Dr. Saxanian at the information school uh, has uh, looked at some years ago with regards to Taiwanese and the United States. Some of that same brain circulation process has been occurring with returning Africans with PhDs and advanced degrees. And then I also think 
that non-African migrants to labor markets in African cities, specifically in science, are going to be critically important and that we may see an, an, a growing impact from that. So this transformation we're talking about is it's time to stop talking so much about how do you get Africans to absorb technologies from outside their region uh, to how do they create indigenous technologies. And I actually don't know what an Africanized computer science would be or even if it makes any sense to talk about what effect ethnicity, race, geography has on the character of computer science as knowledge. But if it were totally irrelevant, I'd be surprised. Um, uh, Professor Corsa, who is at a private university in Accra, Ghana, uh, voices uh, what I think you're hearing more and more of from African scientists is, can we create something of our own that's not only valuable to us, but also to others outside of Africa? And she has a, a PhD from Carnegie Mellon in robotics and, and is a colleague of, of Professor uh, Ken Goldberg's. Um, the Internet's got a lot to do with this destabilizing. I think it occurred to many um, intel, you know, intelligent, active African code writers that if they can download stuff, why can't people download the stuff they make? That, and I think that's uh, something about um, IT that doesn't, say, apply to producing pharmaceuticals, say, or, or a better solar panel. Um, you know, the key thing that I'm focused on is the social reality does innovation arise in a social context and out of a felt response to real problems in your existential environment? Um, because if the answer is no, if that's not relevant at all, then it's very clear that a few, group, a few smart people in a few places will just innovate for the entire world. The rest of us don't need to bother. It's just an absorption problem. All our problems will be solved by a few people in Cambridge and in Berkeley and a few other spots. So give it up. But I think a lot of, there's a lot of reasons to think that uh, social reality has a real um, impact. One is the pervasiveness of mobile phones in the absence of reliable electricity systems and robust landlines, land telecommunications. That's an destabilizing, and then to some extent um, the geography and climate of uh, tropical Africa may be, may be another issue. Uh, I'm going to focus on uh, the one star university to emerge um, in Kampala, Makerere University in Uganda. Um, they have, when I, when I first visited them, the undergraduate CS activity was so um, attractive that students were actually taking classes at midnight to, you know, because the classrooms were busy. Uh, they built a building and the man, the man who was the spearhead of this computer science program is now the head of the university, which is a very political position in Uganda. The, under the British system, they call him the vice chancellor. And so the president, it, you'll, you'll meet him a little later, but the idea that an African university is now run by a computer scientist with a PhD, I mean, that gives him enormous advantages in understanding how to mobilize resources and talent from around the world. No other university outside of South Africa has um, achieved this kind of scale. Um, so areas of research, I mean, I'm going to comment on this later but you're not going to be bowled over about either the goals of research or their nature. But these are some areas people want to play in. Um, the uh, mobile phone is really important. Pattern recognition through capture of mobile, uh, mobile phone images. There seems to be a lot, a lot of activity there. Um, this is uh, a group of examples from the Macquarie CS department. 
And this is basically taking a picture with your phone of a, a leaf, a crop leaf, and then your phone has an algorithm in it, and that tells you whether it's a normal leaf. I mean, that's, as a non-computer scientist, what's, what's happening. Um, innovating on a $100 smartphone, that's uh, a, big, a big frontier. Uh, similarly, the same type of activity around uh, identifying whether someone has malaria or not. It's the same principle. The phone does it. Now, why is there a new confidence on the part of both Africans and non-Africans is because of this, mobile money. M-Pesa now moves billions of dollars in Kenya. It is the product of the Kenyan social reality that girl, ladies and girls working in cities needed to get money to their mothers. They had to get it safely and that the old way of doing it, of sending essentially a taxi driver to drive your mother money or putting it in a courier um, was unreliable. You had to then call. Once people started calling their mothers, they realized something. If I can call my mother on my mobile phone, why can't I send her money? It turned out that Vodafone, which owns the Kenyan phone operator, Safaricom, uh, started to design off of that basic insight that Western Union, MoneyGram, those dominated international transfers of money, but people thought Africans are poor. No poor African is going to give away money, but it turns out there's a thriving middle class in Africa, and that middle class wants to send its family money. And so the money transfer companies were unaware of this, and Vodafone begins um, designing with Kenyan engineers in Safaricom. It's a group effort. It's, it's definitely a, an example of a transnational innovation project. It's enormously successful in Kenya for a variety of reasons. It is now moving to other African countries, and it may be the first innovation out of Africa that goes global. This has given great... Uh, confidence. Now, before I go too much further, I just want to address South Africa. They had a nuclear weapon. They have all kinds of nuclear power plants. They have satellites. They have, but um, South Africa is a, is a settler state, much like Israel. Um, in, it developed a separate trajectory. There are some important computer science programs in South Africa. But the spillovers to the rest of Africa are limited. Uh, South Africa has in growing pressure to educate more South Africans, and the PhD programs in CS are um, being somehow encouraged to accept more South African students, particularly of color. Because one of the issues has been that South African CS departments have been grabbing Nigerians to meet their quota, or Senegalese, or of, of what of the black Africans that they are supposed to be educating, and now there's significant pushback from the new South African government, Zuma's government, that, wait a second, we meant for you to be integrating with South Africans, not, not with imported Africans from elsewhere. So there's, there's um, some benefit, some spillover, and South Africa is itself a very interesting laboratory for computer science, but it, it, it's not uh, part of the mainstream of this story. So um, I'm looking at African universities that want to build sophisticated computer science communities and how will they go about doing it. And I'm looking at the isolated successes and particularly at Macquarie and also in a, net, a trio of universities in the West African country of Ghana. Um, please note this line, that again, if you are a hard-boiled realist, you could take all the research papers, all the, product, all the output uh, scientifically from all the computer science departments outside of South Africa, and you might say, boy, this doesn't add up to a single department in the United States. But, you know, we've got to start from where we are. And there's a big difference between something and nothing. And I think 
the upside is really large. Um, here are some of the drivers. Um, my, uh, Microsoft and IBM have been in, in Africa for some time. IBM has been very focused on working with computer scientists and employing computer scientists in South Africa, especially around Cape Town and Johannesburg. Um, Google, because they have opened offices in about a dozen countries, in Nairobi, where their headquarters is, in Kampala, in Accra, the relationship between Google's employees, who often have masters in computer science or business or advanced degrees, and the computer community is, is prominent. Google has started funding co uh, gatherings, conferences of computer scientists. Uh, they have started funding specific research by individual and groups of computer science professors in Africa. And to some extent, IBM, Microsoft have done the same. Um, this, you might laugh, uh, wage convergence is occurring. Um, we know that what a postdoc receives at a normal American university is starting to look like a faculty salary at um, Macquarie or in Ghana. Um, wage convergence is really important because it means that the penalty for returning economically is reducing, and it's reducing dramatically. Um, the uh, private colleges, like Assessi University in Accra, where Professor Corsa works, uh, also present more options, so that if for some reason the PhD doesn't want to work for a public government university, they now have an option. Now, a typical challenge um, that we, we see and where outsiders could help is scaling up. So in Makareri, the vice chancellor did something very interesting in Uganda. He first brings in some faculty from around the world. And he's very shrewd about this. He brings in faculty from Jamaica, the Caribbean in particular, um, he also brings in faculty from Europe. And one person in particular who we'll meet actually stays, has been working there six years. Um, he does a joint PhD with two European universities where the PhD students spend part of the year in the European school and part in Uganda. Um, one of the real problems with pulling someone completely out of their environment for many years is re-entry becomes very difficult. Um, so in Ghana, there is right now no PhD program. So if there are good faculty at Cape Coast, at Legon, and Kumasi, there are three major universities, they have to leave the country to get a PhD. Um, this, is, this is a problem. And then will they compete? with each other? Will they each form PhD programs or can they somehow be convinced to try to cooperatively build a single program to get better bang for their money and also to get higher quality graduates? Um, this is the Vice Chancellor. Uh, he is the head of Makareri University which attracts students from throughout East Africa and um, He's got a lot of vision. I think one big issue, because his, he now has 22 faculty with PhDs, he has over 50 PhD students in the pipeline, and I think one key issue for him is quality, evaluating the real quality and benchmarking. One project I've tried to get people interested in, because I need a computer scientist to do it with, is benchmarking their graduates, benchmarking their faculty. I think he would let us do it, and I think he'd want to know the answer, but that's important. Um, in Kampala, uh, Paul Bagienda is part of the ecology. He has uh, degrees in computer science from Princeton and Cambridge. He doesn't have a PhD. He has a master's from Cambridge. Um, he is the only African to have his software in a cell phone operating system. Um, the old Zane commissioned him to put some code in the operating system, I forget to do what, but he, he's a good example 
of the synergy that exists between a returnee and the university he teaches as an adjunct. Um, uh, James Hafron Aqua and Ken and I were talking about his, his elusiveness. I don't have a photo of him, uh, but he is a very interesting story because his PhD was a DARPA-funded project to analyze whether when I walk like this, I have a distinctive signature. So I suppose if I'm wearing a mask or like a hood, you can know who I am, and I suppose you could send me, I don't know, Valentine's Day flowers or candy. And so just from seeing how I walk, so when he gets back to Ghana, he is now teaching, he's the chair of the computer science department at the Kwame Nkrumah University in Kumasi, and uh, one of the mismatches, skills mismatches, is that the uh, largest government employer says to him, can you help us because we have a lot of people walking out of the building when they're supposed to be working. And some of them even cover their faces so our cameras can't see who they are. He says, what if you could develop a program for us that could tell us who's walking out of work when they're not supposed to be? You know, this is all starting to make sense. This is about the social reality, by the way. Um, although I wonder from, well, of course, we're, in, we're, we're dealing with public employees ourselves today, so I won't say. But, I mean, every government has this problem. Do public employees put in a full day's work? In, 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 and this is the Social Security Agency. So this is a little bit got him thinking about how would you put this to civilian use? And it's part of the social conditions that might stimulate something useful. Um, he, one of the things that I think is interesting is you're seeing China start to be a player, start to be a place where Africans go for one of their degrees. Um, Soviet Union used to be. Now I think China is more and more trying to attract African graduate students as well as undergraduates. So um, his big problem is he doesn't have a PhD program. When he sends his faculty, he has three right now going. He has 15 computer scientists, all with masters, except for him and a few others. They have PhDs. He's had to send three away, and he can't replace them. That's part of the problem. And so the teaching load gets much heavier, and hopefully these guys will come back. Now, this is one of my favorite Africans, John Quinn, you all saw the movie Last King of Scotland. He's from Scotland. No kidding around. In 2006, he writes me out of the blue and he says, I've just gotten a PhD from Edinburgh. I'd like to be an African computer scientist. I want to teach and research computer science in Africa. He asked me where he should go. I said, you should go to Kampala. I had some um, knowledge. And he's been there ever since. Uh, he's now directing four PhD students. He gets grants from Google, Microsoft, IBM, others. He's been at international conferences. He just re returned from Japan, uh, where he was two months, uh, in a CS lab. What I say to Africans is that the reality is you must import talent to a degree. We have many American scientists that are unemployed. In his case, in Europe, where professors earn much less and postdocs earn much less, the $3,500 he's getting paid, tax, essentially tax-free in Uganda, isn't all that much less than what he'd get at a European university. And so wage convergence, and um, he's done some impressive work. Um, this is one of his uh, uh, recent PhD students um, with the, the European university. He's homegrown. And he is working on a number of these mobile phone-based um, projects. Um, Ernest is in the pipeline. And um, to, to me, underneath that plain English are a set of mathematical problems and relationships that uh, he's, he's, he's working on. Automatic diagnosis of disease is a is a pattern recognition problem that uh, they think they have uh, a, lot of, a lot of potential positive applications. So if you're used to seeing African men raping, pillaging, killing, whatever, I'm telling you, 
I know many more of these guys. I'm impatient with how long it takes for these men to get recognized. It is time to recognize their achievements. Chanda Chasawa is from Lusaka. He has a current project, and I can't evaluate it technically, but I've known him for five years now, and he believes there is some meaning to the phrase, an African search engine. The Chinese have a search engine. Maybe the Africans will get one, too. It sounds quixotic, but he's an extremely accomplished man and uh, very varied. He has a set of pro uh, programmers uh, working on this. Now, this is the father of computer science in West Africa, former professor from MIT, brought the Internet to West Africa in the mid-'90s. Nee Quainor is a legend in African science communities. Um, he still teaches at Cape Coast, and he, he has made an important uh, positive impact on the community of computer scientists, and he knows world-class excellence. Uh, Ayorka Corsa, she's um, co-founder with uh, Ken of the Afron Network and this low-cost robotics initiative, um, a new PhD who has chosen to start her career at a private university in Ghana and at this point is balancing the demands of teaching and service with, with her needs to, to do more research. So I'm going to finish up... Um, with just a couple, of, a couple of comments about obstacles and um, then take your questions. You know, many obstacles. Um, consulting can seem more attractive than research because there are many IT and computing demands in an African country. Um, the top CS faculty member at Cape Coast has been essentially forced to manage the broadband network which is a big deal because the broadband bill is large, so it means he has to handle a lot of money, and, and it's essential for the university, so this takes away from his potential research. Um, the lack of coordination. Uh, so the, these, are, these, are, these are some of the barriers. But I do think that it's not a question of when, uh, of, of whether, I'm sorry, not a question of whether, but when, you know, what, where is it going to happen? To sustain a few nodes of world-class excellence in computer science in Africa, it's just inevitable, and it's really a question of what its character will be. Um, I think one of the key variables is how many young Europeans and Americans with PhDs decide that they will take the opportunities that are there. Uganda is unusual in hiring and accepting outsiders. Uh, Ghana, I have not seen that evidence of them willing to do it. Nigeria, no. Uh, Senegal, no. So there has to be some kind of mindset change. But as Uganda and Makerere gets more and more positive attention globally, I think people will look at them as more of a model. So thanks, thanks for listening. It's a pleasure to talk to you about this. And I, I'm interested in your questions. Uh, Rick, yeah. Is there any difference that you were able to see between uh, French speaking and English speaking yeah. in parts of Africa, the traditions of the universities, or the ties to the European mm -hmm. uh, former colonial powers uh, in terms of collaboration? Yes, good question. The situation has essentially flipped from the period of, say, the 60s to the 80s when the Francophone community uh, was fully or very integrated into French universities. Um, since the 90s, those relationships have eroded, and I think the Francophone um, countries feel somewhat abandoned by... Um, France, and there's a growing um, push for English instruction at Francophone country universities, so Cameroon, Senegal, and, and um, I think that uh, the, the rigidities of the French 
academic culture have been very, very difficult. The Anglophone world has been more open, and I think the opportunities for collaboration are much greater. Other, other questions? Yeah, Ken and then... Thanks, Craig. I'm really curious about the... the, the I mean, you're, I think you're in a really interesting position to see the, 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 the much the complexity of the relationship related to the Randy's point about the, the different subdivisions. And I'm curious about how much you see as collaboration occurring within Africa, across countries. What are the barriers there? Where, is it, where, where are the natural allies? And then also, what about the sources of, of support, say, from the petroleum uh, organization, uh, company, corporation? Can they be tapped to provide some support for these kind of efforts? Well, um, the, the um, relationship between the, the local economies, I think, is, is improving so that you're seeing more commitment on the part of governments and civil society to support higher education and to value research. I think that outsiders often see the sub-Saharan as a monolith and there are important sub-regional differences. The first is between Francophone and Anglophone. Um, the second is um, East, West, Central, Southern. Uh, Zambian intellectuals all move to South Africa. So the pull on Zambia is very, is very big. Um, Rwanda has switched to an Anglophone country, and Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Rwanda make a very, very nice um, unified zone. There's something called the East African Community. And Makareri recruits students from that whole region. Um, West Africa remains really fragmented, and, and no one seems to understand who does what in Nigeria and what the quality is. Um, there's a professor of computer science at University of Maryland who has made some efforts to work with Nigerian computer science. Computer science has been frustrated. Ghana is much more open, but the, the depth of talent is much smaller. But, um, uh, so so it, it, it varies a lot, but people should really pay attention to where they're um, uh, going and who they want to work with. There's many good reports that Ethiopian uh, scientists have been very good to work with. Um, surprisingly, the university educated Ethiopian is Anglophone, and there is an astrophysicist at Western Kentucky, uh, Charles Magruder, who works extensively with Ethiopian astrophysicists in observatories. And there's a, but but I do think that the the uh, petroleum industry is a really difficult one because so much is outsourced. So Schlumberger will hire a lot of Nigerians. They may have advanced degrees, but th th really it's European. It's European based. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let, let me, let, yeah, let me answer that one first. You can ask another one. I was concerned that Westerners were overly romanticizing uneducated, self-taught Africans who were using computers. I think this romance fit in with the notion that unschooled people populated Africa and would control Africa's future. I think this was the kind of invidious aspiration for Africans that we need to move past. Just as you send your children to school, you would think an African would want to do that. Just as your children get bachelors in science, you would think an African would want to do that. The idea that they can learn what they need in a web cafe may be true in some cases, but without a functioning university science system, just as in your own country, you cannot succeed in this global economy. So part of what I'm trying to say is there is a role for folks, especially in commercial software, who have grown up through grassroots, but who will be their teachers for the people that want formal education? 
And why is it that all throughout Asia, India, Korea, Taiwan, they put enormous emphasis on formal education, and as a result, they are doing so badly in technology. But yet for Africa, let's romanticize how somebody that doesn't have a high school education maybe could cobble together something that you find interesting, you very wise and experienced Westerner. And so that's all that we have to just go to Taiwan and Korea. That's what most of the African countries want, robust educational systems. So I'm trying to basically say this era of web cafes, it still exists, and there are still people that come at this um, field from experience alone. But many people do have formal training, and they want formal training, and they ought to be able to get it in their home country. They're not building spaceships. They're just playing around with computers and math. That ought to be able to be open to everybody in every country. So that's part of what I'm reacting to. I'm acknowledging it's important, but I also think we shouldn't romanticize this. It's not a substitute for anything. Well, I, you know, um, in 2004, I wrote an article in the National Academy of Sciences journal, Issues, Issues in Science and Technology, saying that computer science departments and faculty in the United States should build individual and departmental collaborative relationships with African computer scientists. And I still think that uh, NGOs can do what they want, but they're not creating new knowledge they're not building infrastructure for future generations to engage in science and research. So uh, there are plenty of opportunities for people, I think, to help. Now, I think part of the problem has been the capacity imbalance. You have many powerfully educated, super talented American and Europeans in CS, and when they try to collaborate with an African, even faculty member or graduate student, these imbalances create a lot of tension and misunderstanding. Um, but I think the, the gap is narrowing and the opportunities for collaboration are growing and we're getting much less ahead of our time now. We may still be ahead of our time, but it's much less ahead. And there, there's going to be a day when the African computer scientists surprise us with something wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I think that Edwin, or it's what Edwin's voicing is, I think, a, a general feeling that uh, brain drain could be reversed with greater opportunities in higher education. I would say that the sciences within many African cities are not valued as much as, say, a law degree or a medical degree and, or accounting. And so one of the issues is how do you get African, talented African students to go into the, the hard sciences? But... It's a small point. More, more questions? I have a question. Yeah. I'm interested in uh, what you see the role of these incubators. Like there's several incubators throughout Africa, Kenya, Uganda, Nigeria, like there's maybe a dozen or so. Yeah. And um, these all seem to be, let's say, private industry kind of driven. There may be some government support. There may be uh, some university professors teaching there. There's a uh, center for Yeah, where I have given a lecture at, and I know Dorothy, who runs it. And yeah, so these are very important because they give new signals to university faculty who, at least in Africa, can be cut off from um, the real world. Um, second, 
they create some commercial market which gives employers some incentive to tell the university, hey, your training ought to be a little different. Because one of the common complaints is CS undergraduates, when they get out of school, they're, they're not that employable, according to employers in African cities, that they don't have the right knowledge. Um, and, and, and then there's the potential for professors to participate in these communities, either as consultants or launching businesses. And so these are, they're really, really important. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. This is something that uh, the prior speaker is getting at, too. There's a tension within sub-Saharan Africa between elite education and mass education. And I think that at independence, 50-odd years ago, there was a big emphasis on elite world-class education for a few. Now there's a big emphasis on education, primary education for everyone. Uh, high school still costs money in Africa. It's not free. In almost any African country, it costs money. So how do you balance that with giving students in, in, in Nairobi a great computer science education at some cost? So these are tensions, and I think um, they're starting to strike a different balance in some of the countries, a little bit more towards excellence and higher learning. Yeah. What can we do? I mean, what can envision, say, American students at Cal doing to a tangible step that we might do to address this? Well, I mean, I think that looking for ways to build partnerships. Afron's a good example of what, what you've done because it didn't require much money. Ken worked with Professor Corsa and contests which work very well and are popular in, in the U.S. are, are, are novel in, in, in Africa. And so I think that they're going to draw positive attention. Um, I think setting uh, parameters on achievement that make sense within an African context are really important because there are just many constraints on even well-endowed um, researchers there. So um, the other thing is I think that American faculty and um, grad students probably should get a little bit of social orientation uh, around these interactions so that they are not... I mean, I'm always struck, now that I'm so old now, I'm always struck by how young people just feel we're all equal, we're all the same, you're a student, I'm a student, but, you know, it doesn't look that way to somebody in Accra or Nairobi or Kampala. You look really privileged to them. You seem really rich to them. You seem to have so many opportunities, and they don't. And how do you avoid making them want to be you? Because definitely, definitely, they don't want to be you. You are not worth being. Right now, a talented person in any African city can out-earn in absolute terms any American with the same uh, modes. The pay for talent, the demand for talent, it's off the charts. And of course, we see what's happening in the US. Enormous wage growth, great opportunities for young people, all these old people willfully retiring to make way for the younger ones. So we see how in the US it might be that if you're an African immigrant, you could look back at your home country and go, wow, I could really do something wonderful. So I think that that but that takes some, some time to get at. And, and, and I, think, I think it's hard to get away from this idea that we're privileged, we're teachers, and you're learners. I married an African woman, and that was a humbling experience, man. I'm still her student. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right.